Hi everybody, I'm Chad Antorno, and this is my ECE 8496 Summer 2016 final project. I am doing my project on Cuckoo Sandbox. Uh, so I'll go through what Cuckoo Sandbox is through some PowerPoint slides, some of the features. Uh, I'll go through some install steps. There are many of them. I'll go through some of them. I'll give a little demo, and then I'll show you some cool links where you can learn more about it. So let's get right into it. So Cuckoo Sandbox started out as a Google Summer of Code project back in 2010. Google does these cool Summer of Code things where people get together, they'll think of something and then try to build it uh, throughout summer. Uh, it was part of the HoneyNet project back then. Uh, it's grown since then. Now it's independent of Google um, Summer Code and the HoneyNet project. What it is, it's open source. So it's free for everyone, free for me, free for everybody to use. It's an automated malware analysis system. So what's happening is you're analyzing files in real time as they're being run, and Cuckoo is figuring out what's happening um, and relaying that back to you. So what happens is malware is executed in real time and constantly monitored. So you can see all the processes that are going on. Uh, everything can be tracked and logged. And uh, Cuckoo will be able to output that information for you to be able to see. So it's designed to you be used as a standalone application or integrated into larger frameworks. What that means is you can use it for home use, just uh, one machine set up. You have a little VM that's running. You don't have much resources, and you only have availability to do that on your home machine. So you can run uh, Cuckoo on home use. You can also use this in larger companies or even enterprise. It's free, so you have no worry of licensing. Uh, you can set up multiple machines. You can have uh, high availability, HA. You can have a DR, so for disaster recovery, you have another machine set up. Uh, you can have these load balanced, and you can have multiple VMs running concurrently and, and analyzing thousands of pieces of malware. So what you see on the front end is a, you can see a web-based client, and on the back end that's handled by Django, as well as uh, MongoDB for the database. There is a a commercial counterpart uh, that you can purchase for, you know, one of these products is $100,000. You can buy for it and then pay $15,000 for manual subscription fees. Um, but what it is is FireEye makes a product and it integrates into their MVX engine. So the MVX engine is the brain for everything. You can buy, buy many FireEye products and they'll integrate into this engine. And it's essentially doing the same thing. It's launching mini VMs launching the malware on those VMs, everything sandboxed. It's analyzing all of the code, all of the logs, all of the memory that's occurring, and then reporting that back to the FireEye. So that's exactly what Cuckoo does, um, except Cuckoo is open source. So some of the features that you get, you can export a lot of data as well as see this through a web client. So some of the things you can export are the, all the traces, so all the TCP traces um, that are occurring, any any processes that are spawned from the malware. So if you launch a Word document, you think you're just launching that file, um, and then Word is launching, so you think you just have Word running. But a mail, piece of malware can hide um, spawn processes that are in the background, and they'll be launching behind the scenes, and you won't even realize it. So you'll be able to see every file that's created, any, every file that's deleted, anything that's downloaded, and all of this occurs on execution, so when the file is executed, all of this is being tracked and monitored and relayed back to that process that ran. You can get memory dumps on the malware. So you can specifically get memory dumps on those pieces of malware that are being run, or you can get full memory dumps on the entire machine. Uh, and we have tools in here that can be able to relay those memory dumps, so you don't have to actually take those through a manual process to see what's going on, but you can use those internally through Cuckoo. Uh, Cuckoo uses has interoperability through many other third-party open source pieces of software, so it's able to gather all this information. You'll be able to get the PCAP, so the network traffic. You can download the PCAP separately, and you can open up a packet analyzer tool like uh, Wireshark and examine the PCAP and do your filtering and, and research on that. It's also taking screenshots. So as the malware is being ran, Screenshots are being taken. So sometimes malware, usually malware runs in the background and you don't see anything. But sometimes there are pieces of malware 
um, that do require some input or show up on the screen. And you want to see what what happened and why that malware ran and, and what occurred. Um, so for example, when you run a Microsoft Excel sheet that has a macro in the in the file, nowadays you have to click on Enable Macros. So um, before that, executable can launch. So you want to see why did this launch? What happened? So you'd be able to see, oh, okay, someone clicked on Enable Macro. That's how you get this to launch. So then you make sure on your system to harden it to make sure that macros can never be enabled by default. Or only trusted by trusted files. So signed files can only enable macros. So some of the files analyzed, there are many, many more than here, but these are the more common ones. So Windows executable. So if you're running your VM host uh, guest on a Windows machine, anything that's uh, executable by Windows, so the things with .exe, .msi, those types of files. DLL files, so a DLL file can't actually execute on its own. It would need to be piggybacked on some other uh, executable file and then have the executable run some type of service um, that will launch that DLL. PDF documents, so Adobe PDF. Um, if you have a, an Adobe file, it can run, it can be analyzed through Cuckoo. Microsoft Office document files, so those include Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, anything Microsoft related. So for those, those would be more related to the macro-enabled files and, and the VB scripts, which could be hidden inside of, of Office documents. URLs and, and HTML files, you can, you can have Cuckoo analyze a URL if you wanted to. Uh, PHP scripts, zip files, Java jar files, so there are many vulnerabilities inside of uh, Java, and, and you can execute Java by launching jar. So if you have the Java uh, runtime environment installed on your system, you can launch jar, and then that Java file name, and it'll execute. You can also run Python files. So really anything that can be executed, many more than this that we see here. Uh, my focus for our demo will be on mainly on Windows executable, PDF documents, and macro-enabled Office files. So some of the technologies used is a Linux-based operating system. So for me, I'm running Linux as my host machine on a VM. Um, so I have my real computer, and then I have a VM running, and that is where my Ubuntu defer box is sitting on. And then Python 2.7 is, is uh, used, virtualization software. So besides my, my Linux VM that I'm running, you'll need virtualization software running on, on top of that VM. Um, so for me, I have everything segregated, so I don't want to run this on my actual computer. So I have a VM set up because we are dealing with mail, malware. I don't want anything to happen to my main machine, so I'm running it as a VM. And inside of that VM, I'll be running other VMs that with restricted access to network activities and whatnot. Um, so TCP dump. So TCP dump is a great tool for uh, viewing all the uh, network connections and and uh, packets that are occurring. You can use TCP dump. It's a free Linux tool. Some of the tools we learned about. We learned about volatility. So that's for memory processing. Processing. When you pull a memory dump, you can run volatility to uh, see that see what's occurring through that memory dump. Uh, so me inside of the memory, what you're seeing is um, real time processes that are running at that very moment. Uh, so a lot of times you want to capture that memory uh, before the memory closes and, and everything's deleted from memory. So from volatility, you'll get real time uh, beyond what's happening on through um, any other tools that are gathering real time information. And then we have Yara. Yara is another open source, source tool, which is you, it's actually used by FireEye for a lot of their processing. Um, so it's, what it does is it's malware signature based detection. Um, and it's more than just uh, saying um, this is this is this has certain MD5 hash, right? It's not really doing that. What it's doing is it's looking at some of the behavior and saying, oh yes, this matches uh, some other behavior that we've seen before, or um, it's giving information on that type of malware, saying like um, this needs to sit for 10 minutes before the malware is actually executed. So make sure you run it for at least 10 minutes to see what's going on. So Yara can able, is able to, to tell you those type of signature information. There's a man-in-the-middle proxy. 
that uh, actually haven't been able to to get worked out. Uh, I think because of some of the um, certificates that are being used, I just haven't been able to work out the cert stuff on it. Uh, but what's happening is a lot of uh, packets are encrypted, and if you're running the man-in-the-middle proxy, um, the cert that's on the the proxy is its own, so it, it knows about it. Any traffic that goes through, uh, it actually goes through this man-in-the-middle proxy with that cert, so it's able to be decrypt all the data that's that's encrypted on the guest machine. We're using Django on the back end for the web-based, um, Python web-based uh, client that's that's occurring, and then we're using MongoDB to store all of the database information. So the MongoDB, it's, uh, if you know MySQL, it's the same exact thing. Now MySQL is owned by Oracle, so uh, a fork of that has been created called MongoDB. And we also have VirusTotal, which uh, we saw in class. VirusTotal is a uh, is hosted on the web. You can enter in uh, hashes, files. You can upload files, and it'll tell you if that file is or hash is a piece of malware based on scans that is performed on on over 100 pieces of antivirus tools. So that's part of Cuckoo as well. So you can see that through your reporting. So Cuckoo provided this image based on architecture, how it would look. Um, so we have our Cuckoo host on the top left there. That will be my defer Ubuntu box that uh, we're running on. Uh, I have the Cuckoo code launched off of that. From that Cuckoo host, I have uh, VMs that are running on top of that. Uh, and each of these VMs ho hold a operating system depending on how I want to launch the malware code. So you can have operating systems that are running XP, Windows, Linux, Macintosh, um, and then you can even have an XP box that's running different service packs or an XP box that's running different versions of a program. So you can have you can have uh, Adobe Reader version 9, version 10, version 11, and run different VMs depending on which, uh, which version you want to run off of. Because you may have, in a, in a corporate world or even your own house, you have a certain version. So you want to make sure that that version is not sitting on that VM. So you can say, okay, if I run this on my home machine... I'm running version 11. If I run this on my home machine, I want version 11 running because I want to see what's going to happen on version 11, uh, the same version that I have. So we also have in the middle there a virtual network. So this network is iso completely isolated. Um, the, all the VMs are sitting on this virtual network. And then the Cuckoo host will have a connection to this virtual network through IP tables, which will allow internet access because some of these pieces of malware will require some internet outreach to uh, continue their launching their code. Um, so we want to catch all that. It is completely isolated. Depending on if you are doing any type of sharing, though, uh, sharing of files and directories with from your host to your guests, those would be accessible. So you want to make sure to disable any of those if you're running any malware that you think could be uh, could potentially come back. And you know, if you're doing any ransomware that that may want to encrypt those shared files. Um, so it's completely isolated. Again, I have this running on a VM to, for even more safety, and then I have that VM running multiple other VMs in this virtual network. So there are many steps. I spent many, many hours on this, and uh, so this is just a snapshot of some of the steps. I'm still configuring to this day. Like I said, it man in the middle proxy. I haven't worked out yet. Uh, there's something else that I, I want to do is to add some more value. Um, so. There's a lot of work that you can do with this. If you want to just get going pretty quickly, you don't need a lot of those other options. Um, but if you want to really get a sense of all the features of this tool, then you want to try to add as much as you can. So on the host, so this is my Linux box. Uh, I want to install Cuckoo, Python, TCP dump, Volatility, Yara, uh, the virtualization tool, VirtualBox I'm using, Virtual Network that we just talked about, and then Community Signatures. Community Signatures allow you to gather uh, signatures and whatnot from the community, right? That's what it's called. Um, but what that does is it enables you to see after you run a piece of malware. If someone else had ever ran this type of malware before and they uh, labeled it in certain ways, so you'd be able to see that information. Um, so they, it, by grabbing the community signatures, a lot of people did the work that you would do manually after running uh, Cuckoo and seeing the reporting. So they save you a lot of time by by doing that. It is community based, so some things could be wrong. So right, so you everything here is open source. So you're here um, you have to just verify everything just to be certain. 
But for a lot of things, it'll give you a great sense of, of how the code is, was ran and if it's vulnerable or whatnot. So we want to, of course, update our Linux machine. So you do the sudo apt-get update and sudo apt-get upgrade. So this is Debian-based, so Ubuntu um, uses these commands. If you use a Red Hat variant or SUSE Linux, then you use different commands. Uh, so then we do wget off that downloads Cuckoo Sandbox current, uh, Cuckoo current, and then tar file. Anytime Cuckoo is updated, this uh, file will remain this this uh, URL will, re will remain the same. So you just do the same command to grab the latest code. Um, I will say at the top there's a docs.cuckoo sandbox uh, URL. We will go to this. We will see all the steps required. I'll run through them very quickly. And uh, this also does provide lots of documentation as well for um, the whole Cuckoo um, program. So you can see what it's doing, how to use it, and all that. We want to make sure we have our Cuckoo, our uh, Python dependencies, our Cuckoo dependencies. So we need Python, MongoDB, uh, pip, which is Python based installer. Um, and then we have our Cuckoo home variable, which I set up. Um, you don't need that. It's just referring to wherever you installed Cuckoo. Could be anywhere. You just need to know where that is so you can refer to it later. Uh, so we're doing a pip install. There are dependencies by Cuckoo besides um, OS based dependencies. So they are set up in that requirements, that text file. And Cuckoo, uh, Cuckoo created all those, so you just have to run the pip install, and it'll go through and get all those dependencies and requirements. And then in order to get those community signatures, you have the utils community.py, and you launch the options all in force to pull in all, if you want them all. You can go through and, and get whichever signatures you want. Um, if you do the all, you get them all. You have to confirm each one, so if you do the force, then you're just saying yes to them all. So here we have the guest installation steps, and I have another link just for the, the guest part. Um, these aren't the steps, these are just uh, bullet points of what you do. Install Python 2.7 and its libraries. Configure the network. Uh, so for the host virtual network, you want to make sure that's configured. Install any required programs for the malware to launch. So what that means is if I want to run a Word doc file, I want to make sure Microsoft Office is on that guest machine. If I want to run a PDF, I want to make sure Adobe Reader is on there. If I want to run a Java file, I want to make sure uh, Java is on there. And if I need to run uh, lots of executables require a .NET framework of some kind. So you want to make sure you have the, the framework installed on there. This is important here. You want to make sure you disable any OS updates. Uh, so after you install the OS, you want to plain vanilla like it was. You don't want to go through the Windows updates. Uh, you want to disable the firewall and any other Defender tools, antivirus, and those sort of things. So you, you're, at, you're pretty much making a honeypot that is activated by you. So you're the um, breacher and launching the code uh, against your own machine. So you want to make sure that every all the code can happen. You don't want anything to be blocked because you want to see exactly what's happening. And then you install the Cuckoo web server client um, on that guest. Um, and then this is very important. We will, what we want to do is create, after all this is done, we want to create a guest snapshot. So this snapshot is very important because if you launch a piece of malware, say it's ransomware, it encrypts all of your files. You don't want to be out of a, a VM now and make another one. So you make that snapshot. It saves the state just like it is um, after doing these first few requirements. And after the malware is launched and ran, that um, all those activities after they're saved are now deleted and you go back to that snapshot. So every time a new malware is launched, um, it started over from that fresh snapshot that's that's been done. That way, if anything is compromised, it's, it just goes back to where it was before. And the Cuckoo configuration, again, these are defined in uh, the Cuckoo Sandbox uh, document information files. Um, these are located in your Cuckoo Home slash conf directory. There are three files that are required to make any adjustments to. That's the cuckoo.conf, the auxiliary.conf, and the variable machinery.conf. The Cuckoo Conf um, specifies the behavior, the type of virtualization tool you're using for this, um, and any other things that are required just on the conf main configuration side. The auxiliary.conf, that uh, talks about some modules that you'll be using. Um, 
so man in the middle proxy would be located in there um, so if you want to use any additional um, modules and whatnot those would be discussed in there the machinery.com that would specify whichever virtualization tool you're using you could use KVM VMware VirtualBox so for me I'm using VirtualBox the file would be called virtualbox.conf so you specify all of the machines you created which machines you want the code to be ran on um, and if you even have a, a more vulnerable machine you can set up a HoneyNet and it'll you can report that as well and then the other files they deal with uh, memory.comp of course that's on the memory side so that would be where volatility would come into play processing so that's all handled so you could say that that is more of like a Splunk like tool where all the logs come in and they're being processed and that configuration file deals with that and then you have the reporting comp file uh, and that specifies how you want everything to be output and reported so to launch Cuckoo you have uh, two tools but one main tool which is the cuckoo.py that'll launch Cuckoo that'll allow you to submit malware manually through command line prompts uh, it doesn't really allow you to see much beyond that so if you run the the manage pi run server that'll start your Django web interface where you can have a nice clean web interface to be able to see all the traffic and whatnot now this uh, is what it looks like when I run it it's pretty busy right in the back you have some two terminals on the left and right that's running the web uh, Django interface on the right and then Cuckoo on the left there uh, in the background we have Mozilla Firefox running and that's Cuckoo Sandbox running locally on port 8000 you see I just submitted something you can submit through the web interface or through the command line um, whichever way you want to do then we have our virtual box there and you see I have two machines XP and win 7 uh, you need to know these names for um, certain reasons when you do your VirtualBox config file. And then I have my um, and then I have my snapshots. So I have cuckoo underscore XP as a snapshot and cuckoo underscore win7 as a snapshot. So you need to specify those as well in your virtual virtualbox.conf. Now you see I have a VM running um, XP, right? And you can see there's a command a console window and you can see a lot of the logs that are occurring at that time you can this is the Python web client that's running to talk to um, the host machine and it's relaying lots of information back you can see there's lots of criticals going on right there right it doesn't look too good so um, you can hide this window as well if you want to make it even more discreet you can have this virtual box GUI not even show up if you want you can have it everything remain hidden now there are some things that occur um, that are occurring as uh, the malware is running. Some things that are happening is the mouse is moving, even when you're not moving it. That's to simulate. It simulates some malware has detection tools in it to say, oh, if the mouse doesn't run or there's no clicking, there's no on click and no off click, then don't launch this part of the malware. So you have a honey net set up, right? Or a honeypot, and you're not going to be able to catch any of this if an attacker goes to do this on your system. So Cuckoo has set up, and they continue to evolve in this, but they set up some a lot of anti-virtualization detection tooling. So to counter virtualization detection malware. Um, so it's very great that they're doing that. There are also other things that sometimes need to be done uh, if you launch a macro based document you have to say uh, enable macros so you you'd want to pull the GUI up to make sure that that happens so it is pretty busy but it's not at the same time um, so we'll see we'll get right now into a demo and then we'll um, get back to some PowerPoint slides so I was talking about some of the uh, documents that are, that Cuckoo has. So here they are. You can go down. You can dig through all the installation requirements, and it'll discuss each area that you need to make sure you have done. All right. So it's pretty thorough. Um, it goes over the requirements. All right. So see, these are some of the first requirements. There are things you can do to have Cuckoo run without some of the optional plugins. Right. So some of the optional things add more value, and they're handled by third-party uh, operating system. Uh, open source 
uh, GitHubs and, and whatnot. So you can install your Yara and PyDeep, which I have here. Uh, talks about virtualization software. TCP dump, installing that. Installing volatility, so that's for the memory dumps. And then creating a user, you want to create the Cuckoo user, add them into the VBox users group, and then uh, add them to the libvirt D group, right? So we can see that on my box, if I grep for Cuckoo in groups folder, oops, in group folder I see in VBox users there's Cuckoo, and then I see Cuckoo um, as well. Um, here. So the libvirt D one is if you're using KVM, which I'm not, so that's why that's not there. And then you install Cuckoo. I have my Cuckoo. I have a I have a variable set up um, for Cuckoo Home. You can see that's pointing to OPT D for Cuckoo. So if we go in OPT D for Cuckoo, you can see I have all of my files in there, files and directories. You can see that conf directory, which is where the configuration files are. The cuckoo.py, that's uh, the cuckoo uh, executable to launch cuckoo. You have your web directory, that's where um, the Django will be launched from. And then you have many other things too. You have your modules, your logging, your agent. So the agent file is what you would push to your guest machines before you create that snapshot. Um, so you'd push that over there and make sure it's running as a startup in the background, whatnot. Uh, so you want it running in the as a startup too, because some malware needs to restart, right? So it gets into like a safe mode environment, and so you want to make sure that that is being started up um, every re every restart, right? So that's where my cuckoo binaries are. I extracted them to there, right? So you can see we have it's talking about right here. It's talking about the cuckoo comp file. Uh, it's telling you what you need to do. Some warnings. Auxiliary comp, right? Uh, machinery comp. So let's take a look at those and we'll see what has been changed and altered. All right, so right now I'm in my Cuckoo Home directory. If I go into comp, I'll see all the files here. Uh, if we vi into cuckoo.conf, we can see we have a lot of the um, a lot of the customization that you, that can happen. So right now we have uh, machinery virtual box so I'm using virtual box so I'm it's going to look for a virtual box comp I can uh, memory dump is off we can turn that on right now it's doing a version check at the top right so you're making sure you have the latest code talking about the results the max all this type of stuff um, I give my server information so this is my virtual network that's my IP, 192.168.56.1. All right, and then the port for this. So the port is default, so you don't have to worry about that unless you make some changes. You can set up a, a larger database, MySQL database, to instead of SQLite for more database info. Um, and then that's that. And then we have our auxiliary, where we can specify where TCP dump is located, right? So you want it sniffing. This is where we installed it. You can find out where you installed it by doing a which TCP dump. And you find out the location of that. right? So then you would make sure that that matches here. Man in the middle, we want to turn on. But like I said, it's not working correctly for me. It's on some cert side. This is the location of man in the middle. right? You can do that the same way with the which or where is, whichever one you want. And then we have our cert. The first time we run a man in the middle, there is some cert information that's going on. So I have gathered that cert, and that's located in, it's under my cuckoo home slash bin and cert there. All right, so that's that. And then I'm using VirtualBox for my configuration. You can specify if you want the GUI to pop up when the malware analysis is launched, or you can make this headless so you don't see it. Um, you can also run VirtualBox all command based, so you don't even have to have VirtualBox running. So I have a, a network interface. This is my virtual network, VBox Net Zero. If I do an IPAS, I see my VBox, VBox Net, 
and the IP that we saw before in the cuckoo.com file. So I will say that right now, if you are building this, you won't see this uh, information. You will see VBOXNet. It won't be up and running, and you won't see this INET until you turn on your virtual box machine, any machine that is on this network, and then VirtualBox will start that network up. Okay, so just turn it on one time, and then this will show up, and you'll be able to run. Otherwise, when you launch Cuckoo, it won't see this network that you have that you specified in the comp, the cuckoo.conf, and it'll error out. It'll error out. So you want to make sure you just start this up one time, just to just for Oracle to create that virtual box. I mean that virtual net. And I can show you where the virtual net is. You go to um, network here. You can pull up the virtual net, but you set it up on preferences. Yep. So you go to preferences network and host only networks you can create you do this plus button you can create a, a vbox net give it any, any name you can edit it and here we have the information there right so it's created but it's not activated until you start the vm one time to activate it all right so if we go back to virtualbox we have our machine here here they're separated a little bit and they just cuckoo describes each one um so i'll just come down so you have an XP machine, so you can create as many of these as you want. And here's the snapshot name, right? Cuckoo underscore XP. Here's the IP of that. I set up a static IP on my on my guest net, on my guest machine with this IP. So every time it launches, it's using the same IP. It's a Windows platform, so Cuckoo knows how to launch things, right? And the label I have for it is XP. Now we did create another one for Windows 7, and here it is condensed without all that. Uh, commented out describing files. So I have Win7, label of Win7, platform is Windows, IP is .102 on the same network, and the snapshot is cuckoo underscore Win7. Now here you have a Honey D, so that's a, a Honey HoneyNet daemon that's running, and you can specify it here. This is on by default, I'm not using this, but you can set up a Linux-based HoneyNet to catch everything. All right, so those are the required fields that you need. Um, so we can get this going now. So I get back to, if anyone ever wants to know how to, do, how to clear the screen real quickly, you do control L and it clears the screen. Now another cool command is if you do a control R, you get reverse eye search. So that's looking through your history. This has nothing to do with Cuckoo, just a little cool little tip. This looks through your history so you don't have to look through it yourself and you call up, you just type in any command and as you type real time searching. So cuckoo, right? So the, that command is that one I found. If I do another control R, it will search through and find all the all of the kooks that it finds, right? Right. So for me, I'm in the conf file. I want to be in cuckoo home, so I can get there, right? Let me go back to my home right now. To PWD to say where I am. Now I can launch this two ways. I can get into, I can change directory into my Cuckoo home and launch Cuckoo from there. All right, so now I'm in Cuckoo home. Opt D for Cuckoo, and I have all of my uh, code right there, right? Or I can go back and I can launch Cuckoo home. And I could say cuckoo, right? So both of these ways will start cuckoo. That's all that's required to start cuckoo. You can see right now. Um, all right, let me let me clarify this. If I go back to conf and then virtual. VirtualBox. If I put the machines in here, I can specify as many of I that I have made by these labels. So I put the label name in here if I wanted to launch on that machine. So right now I have XP in here. This may be a little buggy or it's because I don't have multiple pieces of infrastructure. But if I do add a, another machine through comma separated value like it shows here, 
Um, it only launches on the, the first one for some reason. So I'm not sure why that is. So even if I put two in there, it's only going to launch on the first one. So right now I have it running on um, XP. So if I launch Cuckoo now, now it's running, right? And it's just waiting for something to be submitted. Now I have uh, this directory here with payloads in it, right? And I have a bunch of payloads, executables, PDFs, executables, right? Document file. Um, I have two that we use in class, Croker EXE and Nibbler.exe. So I'm going to go through and just show uh, some of these being ran, right? So I can submit two different ways. I can submit through um, just command-based, right? So if I go to CD OPT defer cuckoo utils, I have a bunch of utility files in here, right? Uh, is this the yep? And if I do a submit, I can launch uh, the code from here, and I can submit, say submit this file, right? Now it will submit through the console. See, it's activated. See, I have my Windows machine. Since it's set to GUI, it pops up automatically. This is the sandbox state every time. So the agent is running, and now the code is pushed, right? So now you see the code was just pushed over there. You see there's some entropy going on, right? There's some, some movement and whatnot, some clicking that is being performed. So that's just to make sure that that file is uh, being executed, right? Because we don't want any um, virtualization detection tools to, to be blocking this. Now this does take some time um, depending on the what ha what's occurring. So right now it doesn't look like much is happening. It looks like the, the work probably already was performed. But nothing is killing uh, the machine to stop it. So the cuckoo is just going to continue running until it timeouts and then it will report back. Uh, we can also launch the, the web client. So through uh, Django, this will be ran. And you can do this as the virtual machine's running. You can set this up. So we go to OPT defer cuckoo. Uh, that's just where I put my cuckoo. And we have a web. If we look in here, we have a manage.py. And we run manage.py with a run server command. Now this will start our Django instance. And it gives, it specifies where it's located. Right? So we can copy and paste this here, and then paste it into here. All right? So now we have Django running. Right? Um, see if there's anything pending. You can submit multiple at once, and then you can see that it's running right now in our recent. So you can also submit through the interface too. And like I said, you have a file method or a URL. So we can put a URL in here if we wanted to. You also have some advanced features, so you can, uh, you know, process the memory dump, full memory dump, uh, set certain timeouts, right? Uh, disable disable certain behavior analysis, and enable certain services. You would specify these services um, in one of the configuration files too, as well. So you can specify what the tool is. You can see in the background the VM stopped, right? So now um, the code is being uh, researched, right? So you can see there's a bunch of errors. These are because I have the community um, signatures being ran and they, they're they handled by the community, so there are some errors throughout. So you could see the code, you could see that it started, um, the network connection happened, and started analyzing on IDXP, right? So, and, that's, and it gives the port, right? Because we had specified with the label XP ran this on. So if we had that specified Win7, it would run on Win7. And then we see report generated and process completed. So if we go back to our Cuckoo interface, web interface, we see the recent here, and then we get an MD5 hash, and we can click this. It says reported. Uh, and now we get a bunch of more uh, analysis features, capabilities. This error here, this is... This is around the man-in-the-middle proxy that I had. There is, it says missing OpenSSL something. I have OpenSSL. I'm not sure why this is happening. So it's something I'll look further into. We have these toolbars up top, right? these tabs, and they'll get more granular on what we're seeing. 
we have the file when it started, how long it ran. We could show a log, right? We could show a log of what's happening. Um, it's looking for a new device name pipe. So for some reason, it's looking for some Linux command. Uh, you can see the file that was ran, right? Ran for 143 seconds. File name here, the file size. So you get some file property information. It creates uh, hashing. So you could take these, you can apply those to a virus tool or whatnot, look for the hash of that. Um, Yara didn't find anything for this specifically, but through the community signatures, you see that there were a lot of things discovered. We'll look through those shortly. But here are the screenshots, all right? So you can pull one up, take a look at what happened. Um, there were some hosts that were called, so for some reason it's calling up this IP right here. These other two are the name servers, so the name server is what's finding this kanjoy.org, so it's converting this IP into kanjoy.org. But for some reason it's reaching out to kanjoy.org, I'm not sure what that site is. Uh, you could do it, you could search for that site, see if there's any issues with it. You can look at the processes that happened, some open files that occurred, um, and then written files and read files, right? So here, the signatures. So essentially what's happening is you have all these analyst features here, right? And um, you can see if you go to this antivirus, this is pulling from virus total. It's saying, whoa, all these reds. It's saying all these are bad. So it looks pretty bad. Some would say it's clean, but most are saying this, this file is no good. Uh, the behavior analysis. This will look at everything that occurred on the memory side of things or on the file processing side. So uh, registry information, right? File information, network information, processes, uh, services that were ran. Uh, so you can dig deep, see there's 32 um, pages of this. So you can get pretty deep with this. You can filter them. If you just want to look at registry, you can see what registry information was changed and altered, right? Uh, so you can see for file directory was was triggered max file size so say so why is this tool doing this right so you can see I, I launched the tools where it's launched any spawn processes so this is the only processes process that occurred you could do network analysis so you could see there were tons of TCP connections occurring right um, against this host this Kandroid host so you say what's going on with that um, so you can go through all the, this is all the network traffic information, so you can get the PCAP for this. And you can download the PCAP, right? And then you can open it up with your Wireshark right there. So let's go do that. Let's just open it. Wireshark's going to open up. And you're going to get the PCAP of that one um, frame, right? So it could be of interest if you want to see all the traffic that occurred. Um, so if there's lots of lots of traffic going on, this really didn't have much traffic, but there was a lot of TCP connections that are, that tried to to go to these multiple ports, right? UDP traffic. So you can see uh, some UDP traffic going to um, our name server, right? Because uh, port 53 is UDP, right? For uh, name server connections, you can see HTTP traffic. You can see the the URLs that are trying to get hit, right? It says not found. So this may be an old piece of malware, um, and this site has now been closed, right? But if it was, was open, we'd be able to see more interaction that could be performed and taking place. Uh, you have some drop buffer information. So from this, uh, some buffers were created with these file names. You can have some admin control. You can delete this from the records. You can resubmit this and compare to another piece of um, mail or analysis. Back to here, this is part of the signature community string, community signature stuff. You have all the information we looked at, but they narrow it down into more specific areas where you want to focus on. Right, so you have some queries for the computer name. So you say, well, why is this, why is this file trying to trigger uh, what this computer name is? You could say a piece of malware wants to know the type of uh, computer or the name to give it an idea of, of how to push that malware code, right? or uh, the name. There are certain generic names when you set up VMs that may be used for a honey honeypot or something like that. And let's say, oh, this looks like a generic VM based uh, name. I'm not going to launch this code because it's probably a VM. So you can see that it generates ICMP traffic. 
uh, connects to an IP address that is no longer responding to requests. Um, so this K Android, it's reaching out to that, but it's no longer getting any hits. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can see that 40 antivirus engines through VirusTotal found this to be malicious. <clears throat> right, and they give some some names on on the what it thinks it is. Download generic. Right. So and this is an alpha here, so we can't truly go by it, but it gives some uh, behavior analysis on the rating for it. The higher, the worse it is. So it gives it a 3.6. So it's saying that this code is probably bad. Virus total picked it up as bad. Uh, we don't really see any uh, activity that's occurring because that that IP is no longer um, that network no longer exists. That K Android. So if it, if it did, it may be able to to uh, bring that score up higher by being able to see what it does. But it is saying it's probably bad. It doesn't look too good. But um, you know, a zero is is a good file, right? So anything above zero is uh, cause for a little concern. All right, so if we go back to submit now, we can now choose another file. I'll choose this uh, PDF document file, and I will launch it through um, Analyze. All right. So now it's doing the same thing. We can choose to see this in real time. It's running. It refreshes every five seconds. We can see the five-second refresh here. So every five seconds, our Django web interface will refresh. So that was one, two, three, four, five. There you go. So that's all you're seeing there is just the web interface traffic that's going on. We see here it's running. We have our Windows machine. Uh, some clicks just happened. You can see that a click happened. So there must have been something that was on the screen and Cuckoo saw it and said it needs to be clicked for the code to go further. If you actually look at this code here, you can see that it's adding new files, and it's, it looks like they're all being called .epic. So just by seeing this manually, looking at it, you would say, oh, all my files are being altered with a .epic. So why is it changing all my files? For me personally, I would think, oh no, disconnect from the network, but it's probably too late, right? It looks like some type of um, crypto ransomware or something crypto malware that's occurring. All right, so it's going through all the files right now, all the files on the system. And it's adding new files, so it's writing over all these files with new files. So it looks pretty dangerous, right? This does take a little bit. So in the meantime, I will go over some other things. So I have gather. you can gather lots of malware online. Um, one place that that gets a lot of malware is this place called the zoo on github and they have um, you can get the source code for all malware you can here's talking about it this is a malware repository we can go into malwares here we can get all the source code so you can look at the source of the malware you can compile it yourself right make alterations to it um, this is always ed for educational purposes only of course you have the binaries which are the actual executables and you can see all of the pieces of um, malware that's in here, viruses and all of that. All right, so some of these are are pretty common. So we have Black Energy, which we learned about in um, ICS class. So that was used on the Ukrainian um, attack to bring down the the power grid. Right, so it used a piece of Black Energy. Um, we have Kilios, which I will give a demo on later. Um, and then we have uh, all of our ransomwares. So CryptoWall, Jigsaw, Loki, Loki, Petia. Petia is a big one because what Petia does is it corrupts the master boot record. So uh, it corrupts the system immediately. Um, and it corrupts the master boot record. So what happens is you really can't do much of anything, right? Because... Now your master boot record is corrupt. Um, so it's a very dangerous piece of malware that is triggered almost immediately. It's pretty difficult to detect. It won't be detected on AVs. Um, then you have Tesla Crypt. You have many other ones. Spyware is in here. Malware, virus, viruses, all sorts of things. Zeus, right? Zeus is a, a very known um, piece of malware. So you have Zeus in here. 
these are all encrypted with uh, um, all the zip files are encrypted so you do need the password to get those you can find them on the site if you if you really need them um, and that's on github right there so you can see it's still running it just ended right successfully generated memory dump for virtual machine you can see where the memory dump is located if I had the volatility session turned on in um, I'll show you that Let's see it's uh, completing now if I had the volatility session turned on in advanced options I can say process memory dump and then it'll activate volatility to see that I won't be doing that today because uh, this is already long enough but you can see that you have capabilities beyond just using cuckoo and gathering information you can actually have other tools um, go through and, and figure things out so if we go back we can see our recent it's been completed it still still isn't in the reported state so it's still going through this and figuring things out All right so if we go to um, where that memory file is located here's where all of our here, I'll go back one more here's where all of our um, analyzed files go so as they're being built they go into here uh, we have we see analyze 2 so it's probably done at this point so we can go into 2 and that was the one we just ran we see our memory dump here so if we look at ll-h we can see the memory is 2 gigs so it just took a full memory dump of this of that VM of 2 gigs right so that's a pretty pretty big file here we have the pcap information right the man in the middle isn't working correctly so that's uh, not really running right now of that dump um, you have some other logs man in the middle probably just errors right see the the main log is empty um, you have the reports and shots and and whatnot so you can actually go in and get the shots if you want the actual files so they're all jpeg files you could pull all these or you can view them through the the web console uh, we'll refresh this see if it's completed yep so now it's reported now if we do dig into it we'll be able to see the same information as before so now this has a higher score 4 out of 10 it's a 4 for evil um, we could see the file name same information before file all right let's look at the signature information allocates read write execute memory usually to unpack itself right so these pretty bad why is it reading and writing virtual memory what's going on there all right so you see the entropy here is very high we saw this in uh, one of the professor's files which I believe was the croaker or the nibbler so the entropy was very high so what's going on why is it creating all this encryption and entropy what's going on right um, so you can see some buffer information it created uh, an embedded PE file it installs an auto run so now on restart an auto run it will occur and it's looking like it's Firefox so you think that oh it's just Firefox running in the background All right but no Firefox is running this executable it creates a boot stat file in the WinXP folder so that's a big no-no why is anything going in WinXP folder All right and then it's also malicious on 30 antivirus right it, it talks about it so you say well, well what happened so you can see some of the log here uh, the PDF ran um, what's going on see the framework was called see it needed a .NET framework and then it opened all these files see we have the dot epic at the end so if we went in this virtual machine now we do have the the dump so we could we could actually analyze and see these files but everything was renamed dot epic now it's happening so quickly some are reads and some are writes that are going on here so the, the all these epics all the pi Python executables are renamed epic uh, bitmap is named renamed epic so it's coming in and changing lots of the files right so if, if you ran this on your own machine now you, you just lost all your files they're now encrypted uh, so unless some some crypto malware is just to be malicious and there's no other purpose it's not to make money off of you they don't set up any Bitcoin um, procedure for you to get your files back it's just straight up malicious and you can never get your files there they're encrypted unless you were to create a brute, brute force the key somehow so that's that one you know again you could dig through you could see the network analysis uh, UDP so that's just going against um, our broadcast network so that's our own network 
but you get the PCAP for that as well. Uh, we'll run one more. This is going on pretty long. I'll run uh, Kelios. And we will analyze that. So it's running. <coughs> so it's running on our XP again. Again, I had the Windows 7 set up. Um, so I could have done this on Windows 7. But it's it's the same thing. I just don't want to spend more time on you. You've already watched this for so long. And then we come in here. The dump's in there. I'm going to delete that dump because it's massive. Well, let's see how much space I have. So it looks like I have plenty of room still on the system, right? It's pretty large, so I'm not worried about that dump. But like you see, if you can run these dumps, uh, it takes a huge amount of, of space. So you want to make sure that your VM that you create or whatever host you're running off of has enough storage space to be able to handle anything you throw at it, right? Because uh, when you analyze memory and logs and all that, they could take up quite a lot of, of hard jar space. So and if you do multiple of these, if you're running, you know, if you do, do 20 um, submissions, you know, and you do memory dumps on each, that's 40 gigs of memory. So it's pretty, pretty big. So make sure you have a, a good machine that can handle all this. Now, yep, you can continue going through the, the Cuckoo documents. Continues to specify more information, talks about the memory, so you can get all the information on it. Um, there's this website called mailwr.com. So this is actually owned by Cuckoo. They run this, but you can go get to it yourself. It looks like Cuckoo, right? Similar. Um, but this is hosted on the web. You can search for things. You can analyze files. You can search. Um, so this is essentially a, a Cuckoo running um, outside the network, right? So you can access it. So it's taking a while. Here you can search for things. You have keywords. You can do this on, on ours as well. You have the same features that you do here, right? And you can run strings and look for things, look for certain URLs or names or files and, and what that. Now uh, you could submit, right? So you can submit a file just like we did, analyze it, um, whatnot. So you can see that it ended over here. So we can now analyze. So if we go back to Cuckoo, should be analyzing it. The dump is being created, right? That's probably why it took quite a while last time. Alright, so if we back up, see three there is the latest so we go to three get that same information get another memory dump ll-h um, two gig memory dump again right because that's uh, probably how much ram i have running so it's getting all the ram now this one's crazy 7.2 out of 10 and it even specifies you should not open this file on a production system right so even even Cuckoo knows that this is horrible through this alpha tool that they have. So what's happening is uh, now now we have one in Yara. Yara is taking notice now. Yara even knows about this one. It's so bad. So it has VM detection in here. Yara is saying this has anti-virtualization techniques or virtualization techniques. So when you run this, you want to you want to deploy anti-virtualization techniques. So Cuckoo knew about this. It used Yara. Yara told Cuckoo um, that it's using virtualization tooling to discover. So Cuckoo says, okay, well, now we need to step up our game and try to change some things around. So it uses what Yara gives it to try to change some rules. So Yara is rule-based. It sets up rules specifying when this, when this occurs, you need to start doing something else, right? So you can see all the information that was gathered through our signatures here. Queried for the computer name. Process, process is crashed. Look at all that. Just null data that's pa being passed through, right? Until enough null data goes through, then it crashes. And then once the process crashes, then it's able to alter that, that memory of that file and, and change its process, right? So here we have sleep occurring. Try to sleep for 220 seconds. So every time I run this, this is different. So this uh, 
They must have a random field set in here to sleep for a certain amount of time before this malware piece is launched. So by having Yara in here, we have Yara has built-in rules, right? Saying, okay, it's now it's detected. It's detecting 220 seconds. Let's change some timestamps around so that 220 seconds occurs, and let's have this being able to be launched. It creates executable files, so it uh, creates PCAP files, right? So for some reason, it's creating these PCAPs. It's probably going to relay those back to a network somehow and push them back. It creates these services when PCAP now is on the system. So now it's tracking all of your network traffic, right? So anything you do is going through WinPCAP. And so if you go to a bank or something, it's going to be able to capture that, that PCAP information. It's just installed as an auto run feature. So network checker for some reason, um, it's being what it's being called. Attempts to, here, oh, here's a big one. It attempts to access Bitcoin or coin wallets. So it's looking to see if you have Bitcoin or any wallets on your system. And it's going through all of the users, and it's saying, is there a, a Bitcoin in the application data, and is your wallet in there? It wants to take your wallet with all of your Bitcoins. And then it's also looking to harvest your FTP credentials. So it's looking for any FTP piece of software on here. You may not have these, but it's looking for any that it's programmed to look for. And it wants to pull the INI files, which probably have your connections in there. Right? It's looking for all the users. Um, it's looking for for all of these um, FTP programs. And it's just trying to pull data, right? So scary, going through the registry to get this information. It's looking for all of your installed applications. It's getting a list of installed applications. What what service pack you're running, what KB you're running. Because it wants to know, oh, can I launch my malware on this? If uh, you have a certain KB, then I need to launch my mail malware a little differently. Right, we have installed WinPCAP. Right, so not WinPCAP is installed in Win in System32. Antivirus tools are all acknowledging this to be malicious. Right, malware, backdoor, right, crypto, and then it connects to an IPs. Look at all these IPs it tries to connect to. Look at all the IPs. So it's trying. It's really trying to get this information out there. It's trying to set up these IPs. Trying to get all this information out there, trying to pull all your data, trying to steal you, right? So this is, uh, you know, this is trying to steal your own computer person. So it's very, very bad. So we can keep going further and further with all this, right? You get a network analysis, drop files. So you can see when PCAP was dropped as a DLL, so push the library out. Um, temp executable, right? Behavior analysis. Kellyus was the only process that was spawned, but it was able to do all that through that through that one PID. All right, so you can do all this. You can uh, you can get very deep with this. You can use other main, many other tools, which I'll continue to do research on and, and find out myself how to use them. Some of these things are not fully running at the time. Um, network routing, right? So I don't have that set up. The memory dumps to use volatility, right? I don't have that currently configured on here to do Automatic, automatic volatility configuration. Um, but Cuckoo is open source. It continues to grow. Going back to my PowerPoint, now there are some challenges by using Cuckoo. Right? So there are malwares that detect for, that detects VMs, so it doesn't want to run on a VM because it's considered a honeypot. Right? So uh, you have to account for that. So that's why we have Yara set up for the rules. There are sleeper malware that takes quite a while before it launches. I know that there's a Mac OS uh, ransomware that goes through a BitTorrent client called Transmission, and that sleeps for three days. So a lot of people aren't going to be sitting on sitting on their uh, their SOC analyst machine waiting three days for something to launch. You know, they'll leave it open for maybe a couple hours and say, "Oh, nothing happened. Um, okay, this looks clean. False alarm." Okay, so you have to watch out for things like that. Uh, it's automated, right? So everything's done through Cuckoo. You can do a lot of configuration on the back end, but in the end, Cuckoo is still do, doing all the processing. So you lose some of that manual work that may that may have been performed before um, that you would have done if you were doing just command-based tooling and using your your um, 
you know, writing your own scripts to see things or using your own eyes to see what's going on through logging and whatnot. It's not commercial grade, so you pay a lot of money to get the commercial grade. It's uh, constantly updated. Um, bugs are figured out immediately. Uh, they try not to push any code out with any bugs, right? Um, so features are happen quicker than the open source community can probably handle. And then no dedicated support. So by paying commercial product, you pay for a license, you pay for maintenance and support. So if you do have an issue, or if you want someone to look at your code, uh, the malware that's being launched, and you have all that that data to be exported, you can upload that to a support team that'll handle your case and l let you know pretty quickly what you're seeing. So if you don't have the skills to understand all this, you could send it out to a dedicated support team. So those are, are some of the drawbacks and challenges by using Cuckoo. Um, but all in the end, it's a, it's a great tool. Now, I do have lots of credits and resources that you can go to. So the Cuckoo Sandbox, where you get the code. The docs, where you can go through and learn about the install, learn about all the configuration that's occurring, set up Yara, um, and all the other tools that you can put in. There is a YouTube that, video that you can watch by one of the um, developers for Cuckoo. Uh, I think there's about five developers. This is a, a um, security video on by one of them. Virus Total, of course. Um, Virus Total, I guess they they are the makers of Yara, so I guess I, I guess that's true. Uh, here's some GitHub's on volatility, PyDeep, Man in the Middle Proxy, and then Malware.com. So that is it. Thank you for watching. Um, thank you for staying with me for over an hour watching this. Um, have a great summer and go Wildcats.